Everything is at once good and bad. You get to choose by your interpretation whether you experience the good aspect or the bad aspect. And some choices are a lot more difficult to make than others. Greetings, epic adventure seekers. Welcome to your guide to demystifying your world. I'm Allie Bierman, and you are listening to Let's Get Metaphysical, Connecting Heart and Mind. If you haven't already done so, please go ahead and rate and review the show. Really easy to do over on our site at Let's Get Metaphysical Show dot com because when you scroll down below the episode and you have a choice video or audio there's a button a clip it says leave a review i appreciate you're just telling us a couple sentences what you like about the show what you think somebody else might like about it and share it with a friend today i'm bringing you a very special special, different presentation. You see, a few weeks ago, a brand new app launched called Wisdom. Sorry, guys, it's only available for Apple phones and Apple computers and iPad type stuff like that right now, because it really is brand new. And you can see it on my website and on YouTube every week even if you don't have an Apple product. And I speak there every morning, Monday through Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern time. Now, here's what's cool about that. You get to come up out of the audience. You get to click to be a guest and you get to share. So I get to have a dialogue with you. You can ask your questions. You can share your opinion. And I absolutely love that. So today I'm bringing you one of the more recent episodes. So kick back and enjoy and let it mm, circulate around in your mind. And join me weekdays. 10 a.m. Eastern Time. And if you can't make it live, the other cool thing is automatically recorded and you can choose whichever topic you want to listen to. Okay, so today I trust that the topic given was something that people will want to jump into. See, everything in life is a choice. Some choices are easier to make than others, and everything is a choice. So when I'm talking about a choice, I might be talking about it in a different form rather than yes, do it, or no, don't do it. But what I'm actually talking about is Everything that happens, every event, every circumstance has absolutely no meaning in and of itself. Your interpretation of the moment, of the action, of the occurrence is what gives it meaning. And it gives it meaning for you. Now, here's the kicker that most people aren't aware of. If it's a little bit good, you're choosing to see it that way. And the fact is, you could have made the choice to see it as a little bit bad. Now, in the same vein, if it was a lot bad, again, that would be a choice that you made. You could instead make the choice to make it a lot good. Now, that might sound like really nutsy because if you're talking about a traumatic thing that happened or a loss or a loss of somebody close to you yes that's going to be really really painful and maybe there's another side maybe that person needed 
to move to transition to the next plane. Maybe it was a blessing for that person. And if you were the caretaker, maybe it was a blessing for you. And at the same time, it's a big loss. So everything is a choice. And where you focus expands. But the energy that you're putting in to your focus, it's falling. It's making it bigger. When there's a movement out there in the world and it's focusing on this is a bad thing and we got to stop it. It's making the movement bigger. It's giving it more powerful because more energy is going behind it. This concept first came to me 25 years ago after I had that brain injury and because it was so bad and my whole brain was swelling. And you know your brain's confined to an area. So when it swells, there's no place else to go. It's bumping up against the bony ridges that are the inside of your skull. It's painful. It's really painful. I mean, it hurt way more than the migraines that I had gotten for so many years. Hey, the migraines feel like a walk in the park. And then the universe gifted me with the first time that Bob Proctor offered his course, uh, getting the science of getting rich. And, and it was absolutely phenomenal course. It was my first introduction to Bob Proctor. And I think he's absolutely brilliant. And he's a fantastic teacher. It was a great course. And in addition to his course, I had weekly sessions with David Nagel. Now, it was the first time I ever came across David Nagel in the very first class. I was having trouble following because the pain was so overwhelming. And I brought that up to him. And I said, it hurts so much. I'm having trouble focusing. I can't read this stuff because my eyes weren't working. My brain, the part of my brain with vision really is what was not working. And he stopped me and he said, choose to see everything differently. And of course, that thought when I was in all that pain and I was not understanding what he was saying in the how to live your life realm. He was saying, I can make a choice to focus elsewhere. I can make a choice to move past the pain and maybe it would disappear. So once I got that message, I actually started doing that. In fact, I think it was yesterday. It was definitely earlier this week. It was yesterday when I was telling you that I came to a place of recognizing when I went into atrial fibrillation, which feels really scary. And unfortunately, most cardiologists will tell you it is. So be careful if you see a cardiologist, find somebody who knows differently. So I got myself busy and I noticed, well, if I cooked food, like if I was with my grandchildren, if I made them breakfast, day food would stop. If I sit down and I focus on talking to you or focus on a book that I'm writing, it stops. So to me, that was saying, move your focus of attention someplace else, move it away from the pain, move it away from the emotional pain, the physical pain, the spiritual pain, and you'll feel better. And for many, many years, I was counseling people who were depressed or lonely to go out and volunteer. There's so many places where volunteering would make such a difference and it takes you outside of yourself and it focuses your energy someplace different and it can actually lower the depression or get rid of the depression and it will like exercising the fact is the scientific research shows that people improve or decrease their depression 
you certainly don't want to improve it. You want to decrease it, eliminate it, that people with regular exercise have far better results than the people taking the chemical drugs. And I think we all know what chemical drugs can be doing in your body. So it was looking outside of yourself and taking the energy away from the focus that was discomforting. And I started thinking, actually, I recently started thinking, yeah, you can go away from it in the moment. And yes, it can really stop hurting. And yes, a physical pain can be diminished also. However, you have all these very carefully defined file folders in your subconscious mind. And every incident of whatever it is that bothers you, a new document goes in further stuffing the folder. Well, when you're distracting yourself, when you're putting your focus someplace else, you're not only not eliminating the contents of the folder, but you're actually putting in yet another document. Because when you're avoiding something, first you're having a thought of, I don't want it. Oops, in goes a document for that. And then goes in another thought, I want this to stop. So you're actually making it worse when you're trying to avoid it. And notice I said the word try, and that's the number one word on my disempowering word list. And you're trying because there's no way that you're going to be able to succeed. Now, if you have an experience to share or a question or an observation, please ask to join as a guest because we want to hear from you. And where you are is going to impact somebody, you, me, and somebody else who's listening who maybe doesn't want to speak up and ask a question. So please go ahead and do that. So what I was saying earlier uh, about what David told me, and I didn't know how to do it, I was kind of upset with him for years. And David was, and I don't know, probably still is a major, major coach out there. And I came to realize, and, and I communicated with him and thanked him for waking me up to a way of seeing the world, for a way of being in the world that had not occurred to me. So what if when you have something painful going on, instead of wishing to stop it, so, and this is what I did yesterday when I was in the atrial fibrillation, and I, I knew I would, be free of it and time to talk with you. Instead of contact, I have two friends who send very powerful healing energy. There's no such thing as time or distance. So when I'd send them a message when I was in an AFib event, please send healing energy. It came instantly. And it definitely shortened the time. Sometimes it was almost instant when the AFib episode would stop. I don't do that anymore. Instead, I go in and I ask myself, am I the atrial fibrillation or am I the observer? Because the observer is the truth of who I am, which is conscious awareness. I'm not my body. I'm not my mind. And I can choose to live in that truth. And that makes the pain go away. And that worked to stop the atrial fibrillation. And I didn't even have, many years ago, I started taking frequent doses of magnesium because magnesium does a whole lot for 
God, is it hundreds of body functions? And I figured my heart's a muscle. It's going to help with that. And I did that. And I was crediting taking the magnesium with stopping the atrial fibrillation. But actually, it was getting up, putting my focus elsewhere. And now I know to focus on what I'm feeling and allowing it to happen. Now, I have atrial fibrillation because I lost my right vagus nerve, which controls all your organs functioning. Most people don't have that issue as a source. So that in most cases, if you understand how you can get rid of the atrial fibrillation, and that's not the intention of this talk. So I just want to point out it's awareness. It's recognizing the fact that you're not all the stuff that's going on that your ego mind is creating, not to hurt you, to keep you stuck, and not to hurt you by keeping you stuck, but to keep you safe by keeping you in your comfort zone. Now, I've talked about that a few times recently. Your comfort zone is has a devastating impact on your degree and ability to live free and in happiness. And in fact, your comfort zone, think of it this way, it's imprisoning you. You're in a cell, a jail cell because of your comfort zone. Because what's in your comfort zone? Is your past behavior patterns? Are they patterns that empower you? Are they patterns that form your reactions to events? Because a reaction is something that's stored in your subconscious, in your folders, your comfort zone has many different folders so that it's storing reactions for different situations, for different circumstances that are coming up for you so that you don't take the time to step back to respond, to look at possibilities. You just jump in to that feeling. And that's what a reaction is. And the interesting thing about reactions is frequently they were thoughts that you thought of how to be, how to act, how to think in a certain situation, only that situation never actually happened. Many times it never actually materialized in your reality whether you are reacting to it. Reactions taking energy away from your body that it needs to get through each day. So every item, every reaction stored in your comfort zone keeps you deeply stuck in life. It really is imprisoning you because another way to see it is you have expectations of a possible result Probably never will happen, but that's your expectation when you're reacting to something. And by not allowing yourself to actually step back and look and see all the possibilities, because there's never just one possible way to respond when an event happens. There's always at least two, right? I started out today talking about if it's a little bit good, it's a little bit bad. If it's a lot bad, it's a lot good, depending on how you choose to interpret the event, the situation, what's going on. So one way to get rid of that pain, and this might sound super challenging, but what if instead of thinking and wishing and hoping, none of which are strategies, none of which really work, 
instead of pushing it away or complaining about it or thinking like I used to do when I'd ask my friends to send energy to help get rid of the AFib. What was I doing? I was focusing the energy on the fact of the atrial fibrillation and all the things happening during an episode. I wasn't getting rid of it. I was focusing on it. I was making it bigger. And I saw a number of cardiologists, mainstream cardiologists, who said, you have to be on aspirins all your life because you have to be sure you don't get a blood clot because of what happens in your heart during an episode. And those same doctors, almost all of them, not all of them, almost all of them wanted to put you on a medication to slow your heart down. Guess what happens if you have a medication to slow your heart down? Do you honestly believe it only slows your heart down? So I know some people who are on medication, on that kind of medication, and they were just short of being zombies because it slows down your brain. It slows down every organ function in your body. It can't just go directly to the one. And I was fortunate enough after the first cardiologist put me on a medication because he scared me. He really scared me because he didn't have the knowledge of what's going on and how to actually help to heal or what actually causes it. In fact, 99% of the cardiologists I saw had no idea what causes it. And they all wanted to put me on the medication except for this one doctor who said, you know what? If you take the pill only when you're going into an episode, it takes four hours to work anyway. He was the only doctor who told me that. So I stopped taking the pills. I stopped having the foggy brain. I'm somebody who does lots of research. There is zero research that supports that taking aspirin is good for your heart. In fact, the research out there shows it causes horrible digestive problems, things like ulcers. So there's a good side and there's a bad side to everything. And when you look for the good, you're going to find the good. And when you look for the bad, you're going to find the bad. So if you can allow yourself to move through the pain as it's happening, really get in there and feel it, your conscious awareness is what experiences the pain. And as the, your conscious awareness is experiencing the pain, it's also eliminating the programs in your subconscious mind that keep you stuck, that cause the pain. So discovering how to move into being the observer, Deepak Chopra calls it the observer, many other people teaching in the field of who you truly are, call it awareness. Many people call it consciousness. Many people call it conscious awareness. And it's all the same thing. It's a you continuing from one lifetime to the next, to the next, to the next. And we have a guest coming on right now. Hi. Hello. Good morning. How are good you? Morning. I'm, I'm glad to hear from you because I, I see you all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> I try to call it chime in. And as you were talking about how we can uh, raise our frequency, raise our energy by resonating on the good side of the things. Yeah. And, and I heard you talk and I couldn't stop myself. 
Good, good. I'm glad. I, I definitely want to hear. I think we all want to hear from you. Yeah, to soak in the space, um, and and soak in the space. I'm talking about these the the wisdom in your words, and it's totally. Uh, you, you said a lot of things in a very short time, <laughs> and I hope it makes sense to a lot of people, because as you were explaining. What I really liked is when you said everything is at once, good and bad. It's powerful, right? Yeah. And sometimes we don't realize what, when I read these lines, uh, the meaning I'm taking away is, Bhupender, you have a choice to create an option here. You might be saying that this is bad and this bad should be removed. And where I see a freedom here, this bad could turn into, transform into good. And that's possible when we pay attention. Say, for example, there's a rose bush. I actually use this example. <clears throat> Two people are sitting in this room at nighttime and it's dark outside, right? Uh -huh. And they each are sent outside with a flashlight to go find that rose bush. The first person goes in, they turn on the flashlight in that dark night and they so see the rose bush and the first person focuses the flashlight on the flower, on the rose mm -hmm. and sees those petals, that color and they return. And then the second person is sent out to go find that rose bush. And same thing, they, they, they see the rose bush and then they focus their flashlight on the thorns. And now it's the same rose bush, same situation, right? Mm -hmm. But can you imagine how they would describe the same experience? Totally different. Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to say is that flashlight is our... Uh, ability to pay attention on a thing or an object and it comes into our awareness and we are creating our reality. Now the question is if we all have the freedom to create our own realities to give meaning to a given situation or a person or an adverse condition, we are powerful. Right? Oh, absolutely. But when we are not able to exercise this freedom, it's, I cannot even comprehend how painful that is. And mm -hmm. I think here we're talking about is the freedom we all have to focus either on the flower or focus on the thorns. You might say something here that might not resonate, resonate with me, but you could have said nine other things that are of high value to me. Now it's up to me if I negate those nine things and just focus on the tenth thing, right? Oh, yes. And I call it, why don't we dig for the gold? Oh, fantastic. Let's dig for the gold in every person, every situation, and just exercise that option. I, and I try to do that on a regular basis. I... People ask me, how are you doing? I, I say, I'm fantastic. I, I say that with tone. They look uh -huh. at me as if I'm just making that up. I say, listen, I had other options on the table to feel anything other than fantastic. I did exercise those options. Ha ha, but they didn't serve me. So they left yes. the table for me. I, I absolutely love that. It's when people ask me, that the same thing, how I'm doing, and I think inside exactly what you just say, I'm mm -hmm. great. And mm -hmm. if I chose instead to tell them or to focus on a physical discomfort or a confusion, then I'm sending that message to my body, mind, and spirit, and that's where I'm going to go. Why would I choose that? It doesn't make yes. sense. Yes. Why don't I respect myself? That's a fundamental question we need to ask of ourselves. Yes. <laughs> yes, I, I get through painful, uh, oh, 
we're on the same frequency, I'll tell you that. <laughs> we definitely think and seem to live our lives very similarly. And I think it makes a difference for being able to be happy regardless of what the circumstances. Yes. Can you repeat that? I, I want to hear that again. Oh, when you can look at life the way you're describing, and mm -hmm. that's the way I live too, mm -hmm. I know I'm happy, and it's the only way you can live in true happiness regardless of yes. what's going on. It doesn't matter what's happening, how awful it is, because inside I know that everything is good and happy because that's at our core, our true self core. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And people think you're nuts when you say something like that. <laughs> no, this, 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 the reason I asked you to repeat is I want everyone to hear that again. Thank okay. and, and, and it might seem like a pipe dream to a lot of people. If you were talking to me, I don't know, 20 years back, I'm like, what are you talking about? This is going <laughs> over my head. Honestly, yeah. I thought I had no options. The, the pain is happening to me. I didn't realize I was choosing consciously or subconsciously to think the thoughts that were not of the highest value. But it's like being in a dream. Like in a dream, we don't have any control, right? Mm -hmm. Things are happening. We cannot stop that scary uh, movie we are in when we are sleeping. Mm -hmm. And that's the way I see it. The only time when I know that was a dream is when I wake up. Mm -hmm. So we might be in a dream if we think we do not have options. Yes. I don't know if you know what biocentrism is, but it's the whole philosophy of this is a dream too. How do you know that this dream is different from the one when you're aware that you're sleeping? It is also a dream. In fact, that's what I'm trying to say. If we are feeling that we have no control over our thoughts, then we are helpless, which is no different than the dreams we have in our sleep at night time. Oh, that's the same symptoms. That's so beautifully said. Thank you for saying it that way. I really like that. I'm glad to see it's recorded. Yeah, it isn't if if you really compare, you don't have to go read a book. Just from our experience, we know when we have these dreams at nighttime, which we call scary dreams, mm -hmm. how do we feel? We are sweating without even moving. Mm. Right? Yes. And we don't know it's a dream until we wake up. Yes. So we could be having a conversation in this dream, which we think we are awake, and that is the reason we are not able to hear. Because it's a dream. We don't have control over our minds. We are like in a train moving at a very high speed, which is the mind. Uh-huh, yes. And this train says moving at 80 miles per hour. I might have to, do you mind if I jump back in? Oh, please, please, please do, please do. But let, let me continue here. So when I say this, when we are talking, uh, we can see, we can sense, this is also a dream. Dream means that it has the same symptoms of the dream we have when we sleep in our beds at night time, where we cannot change our dreams. means it's actually the thoughts, our mind thinking these thoughts, and we are not able to even witness what you mentioned, we actually become. We actually become that thought. And when we become that thought, then we lose control. We feel helpless. All the options go off the table. So let me jump back in. Okay, okay. Okay, I'm back in. Uh, yes. So, and, and we can just look at our experience. What I'm saying, we all experience this, right? Yes. And if someone says, I don't know, then what are you thinking? So let's look at our own experience. In a dream, at night, we feel helpless. And then let's bring those symptoms. 
and apply that to this state when we think we are awake. We are awake, we are conscious. But what you're really talking about is why this is a dream, why this is not an awake state, because yes, we are conscious, but we are only conscious of everything other than who we are. Ah, yes. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> But don't we say we are conscious beings? But I'm only conscious, even the observer is only conscious of the mind. But is the observer conscious of himself or herself? That's the question. That's um, the conscious awareness. That Maybe that's why many people don't call it um, the observer. Because well, I know for me, observer is like, well, I'm sitting here and I live in the country and I'm observing the animals in the yard, in the woods, mm -hmm. in the trees, in the plants. And that's not the same thing to me as a conscious awareness. My energy shifts. When I go into, when I ask myself, am I um, aware, my whole body relaxes. Mm -hmm. It's different mm -hmm. from if I'm just observing. Yes, so let's, let's put it this way. Let's say when we are the observer, we have the tendency to get attached to what we are observing. Okay, yep, yep. When we are awareness, we are saying that I'm observing, but I remain detached because I know as conscious that I'm consciousness. So, conscious, that I'm consciousness means there's a gap between me and everything else that I'm conscious of. Example, if at night time I turn on the light in a room, all of a sudden different objects will be revealed, right? Yes. And if I ask myself, if I'm that light, if I'm that consciousness, am I moving or the objects in the room are moving? Oh, hmm. I'm not moving. The light does not move. But everything moves in that light. That light is when we are consciousness. We are actually detached and everything moves means what is the first thing that moves within me are my thoughts those thoughts yeah. are like the furniture in the room then my physical body also moves but I'm not moving as that awareness as that light what that really means is that peace the calm that fulfillment that abundance from just being present. What that really means is, I am thinking right, I'm speaking right now, but as you said, with that awareness that I am not these thoughts. Say, if someone does not endorse what I'm saying, I will not feel that someone has rejected me. Right? Of course. But that comes when I know I am that light in that room. And because of me, these thoughts as those things in the room are moving. But where we falter is when as that light in the room, I have made an assumption on that piece of furniture. I am that chair. It's an assumption. In reality, mm -hmm. That light is not attached to that chair. That assumption is a belief, is an illusion. So we are suffering because of this illusion. This illusion is a dream. Mm. Yeah, that, that's where I'm, that's where I am in my life, comprehending all that, and I mm -hmm. get more clarity every day. Yes, more clarity. And, and, 
And it only comes from practice. Yes, yes. If I say, even if I say these words, I have to put myself to the test. When a situation arises, then only I can find out if I've realized the words I'm uttering here. Mm -hmm. Right? It's yeah. easy, easy to say these things. Yes, many people do just say them. <laughs> yeah, like if someone heard my words, they could take these, memorize it, and they can explain that in this fashion. And we have to be very careful. I'm saying it's good to share this. But at mm -hmm. the same time, so be very aware and actually see myself function when I'm with people in situations. That's the only time I learn who I am. Yes. Right? Oh, yes. The, the reason I stress this is so important because um, this whole, the, there are so many <laughs> people who become sort of exclusive, right? It's, what do you mean? Uh, you know how some people leave this material world and then they live like a monk somewhere else, they disconnect themselves. <clears throat> and some are sort of treating the material world as a distraction, they push it away. What I'm saying is, this inclusiveness is really a test than becoming an exclusive person. I only hang out with the people who are at the same frequency, who think like me, but you don't know until you go sit in a different frequency to see if you can maintain you are fan being fantastic uh, 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 state of mind and actually help others also rise with you. Yes, thank you for saying that. That's, that's a challenge I experience because I feel drained. Yes, yes. <laughs> and, 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 and you can turn that around as an opportunity to, to know uh, or go deeper within you, then you go back again and sort of an experiment with, with yourself. Mm. And, and I try to do that. I try not to avoid people. I actually tell people, they say, what, what, what shall I be doing? I say, think of a person you dislike the most or mm -hmm. a situation you dislike the most mm -hmm. and, and, and treat that as a litmus test for yourself. The moment you can transform that uh, thought associated with that person or the situation into a thought of comfort, you have moved on. Yes? You have oh, grown. yes. Yes. <laughs> I'm exactly in that place with one of my coaching clients. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I know I said a few minutes uh, and I spoke for seven, eight minutes. <laughs> um, but uh, everything you say, that I know I'm very grateful because you say them in different ways that I hadn't thought of before. And yeah. that's how I get clarity for myself. And then I can share it with others. Awesome. So do you, I, I don't have anything else to add uh, to this, but if you have anything for me, I'm... I'm oh, I'm well, here. yeah, I actually... I do a podcast. It's called Let's Get Metaphysical, Connecting Heart and Mind. Mm -hmm. And I would love to have you as a guest. Um, and I'm assuming that your profile has your contact information so I can connect with you. Absolutely. You can message me on Instagram, and uh, it will be my privilege to have further conversation with you. Great. <clears throat> okay, so your Instagram is in your profile, right? Yeah, I can send you a message. I do see you there. I just connected with you. Let me okay. send you a quick message. So thank you for your time and providing me the space to share. Oh, thank you so much. I, like, I, I believe that everybody listening is taking valuable information from me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Oh, you too. Now, one thing that our guest just shared was about if he's sharing with somebody and they like nine things of what he talked about, but then they dislike the one thing, and if it doesn't fit in your paradigm, you're going to reject it. Or what I tell people when I talk, when I get, I love to teach. My favorite place is being in a live classroom 
because everything's experiential. So when I'm talking to people, I plant it in their mind that let this go in as a seed. And if the time becomes right, if and when the time is right, and I call that divine timing, it will sprout. And then I'll have a meaning that makes sense for you. And if not, that's okay. I remember many years ago being at a tea Harv Ecker event. And he took this big piece of paper. He made a little tiny dot on the big piece of paper. And he walked up to it and put his eye on the little tiny dot. Right? It's a big blank piece of paper with one little black dot. And then he turned to us and he said, this is what most people do. And he went back, put his eye in the little tiny dot. What most people do is they see the one thing they don't like and they ignore everything else and they dismiss whatever that opportunity was because of that one little aspect rather than saying, okay, that piece doesn't fit for me, but the rest of it does. So does anybody else have uh, another question or observation to share. For those of you who don't know, when I found true happiness, I was lying very still in my bed. I had had brain surgery that took out three major cranial nerves. So besides the fact that I had the, the incision that was it had to be like eight inches long from the top of my skull down to the second vertebrae in my neck. You might imagine the pain from that, and I don't like to take medication. But I couldn't swallow, and I couldn't talk, and I couldn't walk, and just moving was a real challenge. And I was lying there, and I was elated. I was happy. The endorphins were flowing as if I had just finished a workout. Hey, that's one of the reasons that I do workouts because I feel so amazing. Now, looking from the outside, that wouldn't make any sense. And yet that's when I knew this must be true happiness. So when all the painful things happen in my life, I know at my core, I'm still happy. I'm still okay. And the weird thing is my friend's see me as an optimist because I see the good side in everything. I started to talk saying if everything's a little good, then it's a little bad. I choose to see the good side. And you can tell. And I actually do have to go to meet with a client now. I'm very grateful that you are here. And I'm so grateful for our guest and his contributions. I wish you a day filled with blessings. If you look for them, I guarantee you'll find them. And to enjoy, that's one word, I, capital I and capital J, O Y. Enjoy because the whole world you experience, you experience it within. Wisdom talks that I get to do. Also, remember to click the link if you haven't already gotten your Step in a New Direction, because you'll hear over and over again in all my talks, you're going to stay stuck in your life. How's that going to move you forward? Step in a New Direction, gradually. And also, the link will be down in there for the special Thrive gift get the copy of the book Thrive, Don't Just Survive, personally signed by me and shipped to you. And you can really dramatically change your life by discovering all the possibilities and by duplicating some of the things I did to heal from two brain injuries. When all the doctors said, there was no way I was going to heal. They said, learn to live with it. Well, that definitely wasn't acceptable. And don't let something like that be acceptable to you.